Productions. It's therefore time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Well, another week, another damning report is out on the government's faulty fiscal record. Uh. This time we hear the truth from the Financial Accountability Office. The FAO agrees with the Auditor General. They, too, forecast a $12 billion deficit for 2018-19, Speaker, uh, twice uh, what the government has uh, said the deficit will be. The government did not slay the deficit as they claimed. Nope. Speaker, in fact, the only thing they've slayed is any credibility of trust or credibility. The government told us one thing when both legislative officers told us the truth, which happens to be a completely Question. different picture. Speaker, why does this government think it can get away with presenting inaccurate numbers to the people of Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Finance is going to want to speak to uh, this issue in the supplementary. What I want to say, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, we thank the uh, Financial Accountability Office for their annual economic and budget outlook, and we're pleased, Mr. Speaker. And I'm going to quote from the report um, that he notes that this year, and I quote, Ontario, the Ontario economy recorded the strongest pace of growth since the early 2000s, and that, and I quote, job growth surged last year with 128,000. 400 net new jobs, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is our economic uh, growth has outpaced that of most countries in Europe, Mr. Speaker, and in North America. Our unemployment rate is at a 17-year low, Mr. Speaker. Um, now we know that everyone has not benefited from that, and we have made a deliberate decision to invest in the people of this province, yes, Mr. Speaker, to invest in their care. And I thank the Financial Accountability Officer for his support. Back to the Premier. Actually, the Financial Accountability Office was quite revealing. Their report provided evidence, Speaker, that the tale the Premier has told this House about why they're running a deficit is not accurate. The Premier said she chose to run a $6.7 billion deficit this year, saying it was for infrastructure. But the FAO revealed for the first time that that is not true. The FAO revealed that the government already had a $3 billion deficit for 2018-89. This government thought it could get, way, get away with that again and got caught. Speaker, now that the FAO has exposed this, uh, isn't the Premier the least bit red-faced for being caught red-handed? Uh, Mr. Speaker, we do thank the Financial Accountability Officer uh, for their report. He does highlight the fact that Ontario's economy has recorded the strongest pace of growth since the early 2000s. He does cite the fact that our, our job growth surged last year with 128,400 net new jobs. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, we are leading North America, the United States, and Europe in terms of our GDP growth. And the FEO acknowledges that some of the investments that we're making are tremendously significant to our economy and to our society, Mr. Speaker, including the benefits of, uh, of supports for pharmacare and supports for skills and training. <laughs> Furthermore, he has adopted the position of the uh, Auditor General, which is in dispute with independent, world-renowned accounting firms, Mr. Speaker, including members of uh, the Canadian Accounting Standards Board, Answer. who provided evidence and indication that the principles of accounting that are being adopted are accurate. We're proceeding as such, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the report also confirmed our job numbers to go down to 60,000 a year. Uh, in, the, in the coming five years as well. That's something that was also uh, presented in the budget. So the long-term outlook is quite different. But, Speaker, on page 15, on page 15 of the Economic and Budget Outlook, this is where the truth is exposed, Speaker. The government told us that $6.7 billion in deficit was for infrastructure. That is simply not true in the FAO report they show that $3.7 billion is what the promises develop into a deficit, and that $3 billion was a hidden deficit for the years 2018-19. Speaker, 
3 plus 3.7 is 6.7. They had a $3 billion deficit, and why did they try to hide the $3 billion deficit from the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Let's be very clear. We have built lots of prudence. We have reserves. We have contingencies. Yeah. The Auditor General herself and the FAO have noted that we are very cautious in our assumptions and that they're reasonable. They stated that. We are talking about two issues of dispute, one around pension assets and one around the degree of uh, rate-regulated rate accounting, both of which are associated with independent auditors and experts who are saying it is absolutely fine to proceed yeah. as such. Yeah. Those are policy decisions that were made, and in the case of pension assets, that is a, an issue that's been ongoing for 20 years, even when the Conservatives were in power, Mr. Speaker. Wow. They assume the exactly the same accounting principles. We have not done anything other than provide full disclosure. They've had clean audits with the OPG. The Auditor General has agreed that it was accurate. Answer. We're going to proceed as such, Mr. Speaker. We have full disclosure. It's fully accurate. We have balance of books, and we have a surplus, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Uh, back to the Premier. Well, look, uh, they have not disclosed the books. Exactly. They have not been in oh. balance. Yep. They have told the people of Ontario one thing exactly. when both legislative officers have told us the complete opposite, Speaker. Exactly. So I will review again. Why did they have a $3 billion hidden deficit? That's not full disclosure. That's here. It took the Financial Accountability Officer on page 15 to show us a $3 billion hidden deficit. Right. They were not in in balance, Speaker, they have told the House one thing when the truth is completely opposite. Speaker, I want to know the truth from this finance minister and from this premier. Why is there a three billion dollar hole in the budget? Why? Thank you. Yes, it will. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I just want to say to the uh, to the member opposite that when I came into this office and when we brought our first budget forward, we made it clear that we were going to increase the deficit in order to invest in infrastructure. We did that, Mr. Speaker. We stayed on track to uh, eliminate the deficit. We did that this year, Mr. Speaker. We have a $600 million surplus, Mr. Speaker, and we have made a deliberate decision and uh, openly. Transparently, we have made a decision to invest in people in child care, Mr. Speaker, yeah. in home care, investment in hospitals, uh, investment in tuition, free tuition for students, Mr. Speaker, and in prescription medication for, uh, for children and for seniors. We've been very clear, Mr. Speaker, about our intention. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will withdraw. Withdraw. And you're working towards warnings. I'm telling you now. Finish, please. And Mr. Speaker, the reason that we can have this discussion uh, about our finances is that we put in place a requirement to have a pre-election report, yes, and that is what we are discussing openly and transparently, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, thank heavens we had a pre-election report from the Auditor General who exposed a $12 billion deficit instead of the nonsense the government told us. And thank goodness that the Financial Accountability Officer came out today and explained that, yes, indeed, we do have a $12 billion deficit, not the nonsense the government told us. And he further drilled down and showed us in that deficit is a $3 billion existing hole in the budget. The Premier just doubled down, saying that she made a deliberate uh, choice to, to go into $6.7 billion deficit. That is absolutely not true. It's a $3.7 billion that she's saying she's investing there. $3 billion of it was a hidden, secret, hidden hole in the budget. I want to know. We all want to know. The people want to know. Why did it take the Financial Question. Accountability Officer this morning to come out and tell us, you did not Thank slay you. the deficit. You had $3 billion. You. Oh. You see it, please? Thank you. 
Members. Members on both sides are asking me to move to warnings, and I shall. We're in warnings. Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, I, I do understand why the member opposite would be so frantic as he holds the book that the information he's saying is secret is printed in black and white, Mr. Speaker. He is reading the numbers because we are being transparent, Mr. Speaker. And what what he what we are not the member from Leeds Grenville is warned, the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. <coughs> And I missed a third, but <laughs> threw him under the bus. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, he has the information because we have made it available and made it transparent. Mr. Speaker, I also understand that he would be additionally frantic because he's dealing with a leader who is behind closed doors making deals with big developers, Mr. Speaker, and only backing off on preserving the green belt. When he's caught in the light of day, Mr. Speaker, we have consistently been open about our finances. We have consistently supported the Green Belt, Mr. Speaker. We believe that our environment is precious, and once that land is gone, it's gone forever. Mr. Speaker, I understand why he's You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs warned. Final supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. The only people hiding anything in this legislature is this government, Speaker. And thank heavens the FAO showed us the three billion dollar. Uh, hidden deficit that this government had. And he explained why, Speaker. He actually told us how this $3 billion hole came. And quite frankly, it's no surprise to anyone on this side of the, uh, of the House. He has told us it's because they ran out of things to sell. He said the government will see weaker revenue gain due to the loss of time limited and one time revenue. That money was one time sale of assets. They sold Hydro One, they sold buildings, they sold chairs, they ran out of things to sell and now they have a hidden deficit. They told us that it was a $6.7 billion deficit when $3 billion of that deficit was actually a structural deficit. It was built in, Question. Speaker. It is a deficit that they, that they ran out because of they, they stopped running out of things to sell. Speaker, why did they not tell the people Thank about you. this hole? Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, very quickly, it was this government that actually passed the Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Act precisely because that party. The Leader of the Opposition is warned. The member from Simcoe Gray is warned. Carry on. That party did, in fact, hide the deficits. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we brought in the FAO as well, recognizing the need to look at projections going forward. And this is what we're talking about: is projections, Mr. Speaker. Forty years has passed. They've only balanced a budget three times. We've done more than that, Mr. Speaker, almost twice as more. Furthermore, there are public accounts. There's the actual results that are achieved. Third quarter results have shown that we have balanced the books and we have a surplus. DBRS just again made the connection and said that Answer. we are double A rated and stable, Mr. Speaker, because of the fact that we have done so. Yeah. Furthermore, we are putting forward $230 billion over 14 years for those capital improvements, and we've exceeded our target year over year, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. New question? The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. On April 1st, the funding for eight hospital bed at Guelph General Hospital ran out. The hospital says it still needs the bed. It is operating at 111% occupancy, 
It is seeing 64,000 patients per year in an emergency room billed for 45,000. Why is the Premier forcing the patients to be treated and admitted in the hallways at Guelph General Hospital? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, of course, we're uh, monitoring situations across the province uh, at all times in terms of uh, uh, issues where there is uh, a capacity challenge. And uh, we are addressing this, uh, Mr. Speaker. As you know, through our 2018 budget, we are investing an additional $822 million in Ontario's publicly funded hospitals. And overall, this is a very a uh, historic increase overall, 4.6%. Uh, High growth areas obviously are looked at uh, uh, with an eye to improving their situations. And uh, we work with our LINs uh, on a very systematic uh, basis. Uh, we look at the need in each particular area of the province and uh, we ensure that the funds are available in each particular yes, hospital. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The government funded some temporary beds during the flu season. At the time, Guelph General Hospital needed an extra 16 beds. The government paid for eight of these beds. But on April 1st, the government took away the funding for these beds, even though the hospital still needs them now. Why won't the minister provide enough funding to treat Guelph area's patients with the dignity they deserve? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I hope the member of the third party recalls that last fall we did create some 2,000 extra beds across the province. Uh, these are spaces that we did uh, annualize in our funding to a tune of $187 million. We're continuing to work with the LIMS, looking forward at the coming year, and uh, we will ensure that uh, people in this province get the care they need, where they need it, when they need it, and uh, uh, this is an ongoing evaluative process that we go through. We are listening to the needs across the province, and uh, we will ensure patients uh, get the care that they need. Thank Great you, end. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Something is not right here, Speaker. On April 1st, the government took away the funding that you had given in the fall. Those eight beds are no longer funded at the uh, Guelph General Hospital. The CEO of the hospital said funding for the hospital has not kept up with population growth. It is happening throughout our province, in all of our hospitals. The minister's hospital funding freezes has met service cuts to patients. It meant that patients are treated and admitted in hallways and sometimes in bathrooms. The Premier likes to complain against the cuts from the Conservative government, but when will she accept the responsibility for the cuts to the hospital funding that she alone is responsible for? Thank you. Minister. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in the case of uh, uh, the Guelph General Hospital, we are working with that hospital very closely. Uh, we've been in uh, communication with the CEO, the chair of the board, to understand their particular pressures at this moment. We are committed to maintaining the surge beds that were announced last fall. Uh, we understand that uh, growth pressures exist across the province. Obviously, the last winter. There was an exacerbation with uh, a very uh, severe flu season. But we are going to continue to monitor and work with our hospitals across the province to ensure patients get the, the care that they need when and where they need it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Another question, a member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier, on April 19th, the Ontario Energy Board announced what at least seemed to be good news. Hydro rates were not going up. But it turns out that this was just government propaganda, because if you dig just a little bit further, you find that actual hydro costs have jumped by roughly 10 per cent from last year. The government is using borrowed cash to hide these true costs from the public before the election. Why won't the Premier just tell the truth that her $40 billion hydro borrowing scheme will send bills skyrocketing? by 70% after the election. 
Thank you, Minister Premier. of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Fair Hydro Plan, as the member is well aware, uh, is bringing forward and has brought forward, Mr. Speaker, a 25 percent reduction for all families across the province. And then that, Mr. Speaker, is being held to the, the, the rate of inflation for the next four years, Mr. Speaker. And then the Long Term Energy Plan, Mr. Speaker, also shows that costs are being pulled out of the system to keep our system reliable clean and affordable for all people right across the province, Mr. Speaker. It is good news, Mr. Speaker, that the OEB brought forward no rate increases this year. And we'll continue, Mr. Speaker, to work with all our partners to ensure that we keep having a system that is reliable, a system that is clean, and is affordable, Mr. Speaker. For us on this side of the House, we made sure that yes, we sir. acted on it. For the opposition party, Mr. Speaker, they voted against that. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. The Premier is using borrowed cash to hide the true cost of hydro before the election. But background documents buried in the Ontario Energy Board's website show the truth. Actual hydro costs have jumped about 10 per cent from last year. Those are the costs that Ontario families will still have to pay after the Premier's payday loan comes due. Leaked government documents show that hydro bills will rise 70 per cent over 10 years, starting after the election. Will the Premier tell Ontarians the truth that our hydro borrowing scheme drives bills up even further over the long term, not down? Okay, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, there's a document called the Long-Term Energy Plan. I encourage the member to read it, where he will see that the actual rates are actually lower, Mr. Speaker, moving forward than it would have been even four years ago, Mr. Speaker, and where that projection would be. We invested, Mr. Speaker, in the Fair Hydro Plan to make sure that we could reduce rates by 25 percent for everyone across the province, Mr. Speaker. They voted against that, Mr. Speaker. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? They have no plan when it comes to actually reducing rates. What they want to do is eliminate the Fair Hydro Plan. They want to raise rates by 25 per cent, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we brought forward a plan, made forward, we helped uh, uh, all families right across the province and 500,000 small businesses and farms, Mr. Speaker, and those that live in rural and northern parts of our province, they continue to see rates anywhere that have been reduced between 35 and 50 per cent on average, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to act on behalf of the people of Ontario and helping them, Mr. Speaker, keeping a clean, reliable and affordable city. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Premier. And again to the Premier. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the Premier. Minister of Energy was positively gleeful last week after the Conservatives released a hydro plan that kept all of the worst Liberal hydro policies. The Conservative plan will keep the Liberal government's $40 billion hydro borrowing scheme, which will drive bills up by more than 70 per cent after the election. The Conservative plan will keep private profits on our hydro bills and will keep Hydro One privatized. And the Minister of Energy couldn't be happier. Why on earth is this government celebrating the fact that the Premier's hydro policies have been endorsed by Doug Ford? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the NDP platform, when it comes to electricity, has them buying back billions of dollars in shares of Hydro One that will not take one cent off of electricity bills for Ontario families and businesses, Mr. Speaker. I don't know why they think that's a good idea. On this side of the House, we brought forward a plan, Mr. Speaker, that reduced rates by 25 per cent, and they voted against it, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to First Nations, when it comes to individuals living on First Nations, Mr. Speaker, we eliminated the delivery credit, Mr. Speaker. They voted against that. When it comes to low-income individuals, Mr. Speaker, and their plan wasn't even mentioned until the last play page, Mr. Speaker. We made sure. Member from Essex is warned. Finish, please. 
So, Mr. Speaker, let's think about this. They're going to spend billions buying back shares of Hydro One that actually will not do anything to lower anyone's electricity bills, but those billions of dollars that they spend will mean that they will have to close schools, close hospitals. What are they going to cut, Mr. Speaker, Answer. to make sure that they can buy back a plan and a company that won't save anybody anything, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. No question. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, first, the Premier gave Mayo Schmidt millions of dollars when she made him the CEO at Hydro One, and now we know that he's become the $6 million man. Then the Hydro One board gave themselves uh, millions of dollars in raises and tried to make it impossible to hold them to account. We don't know how big the Millionaires Club is, but it's $412 million large. Finally, yesterday, your government, Premier, voted against reviewing compensation at Hydro One. So, Speaker, to the Premier, what we really want to know is, when is the Premier going to start to stand up for electricity customers in the province of Ontario and not the Millionaires Club at Hydro One? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was this government and this Premier that actually stood for families last year when we bought for the Fair Hydro Plan, and that party stood and voted against it, Mr. Speaker. Right. It was this government and this Premier that actually brought forward the Ontario Electricity Support Program to help low-income individuals, to help seniors, Mr. Speaker, and it's that party that voted against it, Mr. Speaker. We made sure that we brought forward our concerns to the board, um, and over the last weekend, Mr. Speaker, our government urged Hydro Hydro One's board to revisit its executive compensation model, and that's exactly what they're doing. As the largest shareholder, we welcome the board's decision to re-examine the compensation model, Mr. Speaker, which will include independent advice as well. The board's decision to increase exe executive compensation was done without our involvement, so changes to compensation, Mr. Speaker, and severance that Answer. were adopted by the board um, were released to us on March 29th. We acted, and we are now making sure that we can have that review through the board, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Supplementary. Speaker, it was this Premier and this government that handed out the multi-million dollar salary to the CEO of Hydro One and then has sat idly by and watched it ever increase. Only we can't see all of it, Mr. Speaker. You know, yesterday in the legislature, members on the government side were trying to justify yep. the salary of the $6 million man. They're trying to defend the indefensible. This government's legacy on electricity is the same as its legacy on everything. Mountains of new debt, a select few Bay Streeters that are getting rich, and everyone else in Ontario is getting stuck with the bill. On Monday, the Premier will send out the in, uh, Energy Minister to say that the compensation is being reviewed. Then on Tuesday, every Liberal votes against reviewing it. That's what happened yesterday and they're trying to justify the six million dollars speaker speaker when Question. will the premier show some leadership and finally deal with the millionaires club at hydro one thank you, yes, sir. Thank you mr speaker um, we brought forward over the weekend our role to uh, as the largest shareholder asking the board to revisit their executive compensation model they're doing just that mr speaker because we found out about this in uh, march at the end of march through the management information circular, the board now acknowledges that as their largest shareholder, which is this government, should be engaged on such material issues and that changes are needed. And so while Doug Ford and the PCs, Mr. Speaker, would take that erratic and reckless approach and fire the board and do absolutely nothing to reduce rates, Mr. Speaker, we believe in a stable solution that exercises our authority as the largest shareholder. And so with this in mind, Mr. Speaker, our government will abstain from voting on the say on pay shareholder resolution at the Hydro One annual general meeting, which is in May, Mr. Speaker, May 15th, to give the board the necessary time to re-examine the matter. Our government continues to focus on fairness for, uh, for all people in this province, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you very much. Your question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, for 15 years, this Liberal government has known about excessive executive salaries in the broader public sector, but has done almost nothing to rein in executive compensation. This week, Londoners learned about proposed salary increases for Western University senior administrators. The Liberals have allowed boards of governors the freedom to select their own comparators to determine salaries without any oversight to
to ensure that the comparators are valid. This can lead to significant salary increases far beyond what is reasonable or appropriate. Similar concerns have already been raised about Nipissing University, and we expect to hear more as university compensation frameworks are posted across the province. Question. Speaker, why has this Liberal government refused to put meaningful controls in place to rein in executive compensation in the university sector? The member from Scarborough Centre is warned. Premier. President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for her question as it gives me an opportunity, Speaker, to not only address this issue but to put some, uh, some facts around it that are extraordinarily important. So, you know, Speaker, our government froze salaries across the broader, broader public sector in 2012, and uh, when we renegotiated them more recently, we put some really important uh, pieces in place. So, for example, uh, our framework enforces strict rules that prohibit executives from receiving unnecessary perks such as pre prerequisite signing bonuses, retention bonuses, unrestricted severance, uh, because we remain committed to ensuring that fairness and accountability in the way that these broader uh, public sector executives' frameworks and pay are structured, Speaker. We, we did away with cash housing allowances, vehicles Answer. that aren't required, and so on. I'll speak more in the supplementary about what we're doing in terms of our framework for our broader public Thank sector you. salary, Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, what is even more troubling is that decisions about executive salary increases are being made after a decade of Liberal underfunding of the post-secondary sector. For years, Ontario has had the highest university tuition and the lowest per-student funding right. of any province in Canada. This has undermined the quality of post-secondary education for students and led to an explosion of contract faculty. It has contributed to deep divisions between administration and academic workers at your York University and jeopardize the career plans of thousands of young people at York with the strike now in its ninth week. Speaker, does this Liberal government believe that increasing the salaries of senior university administrators is more important than the quality of education that Ontario post-secondary students receive? Thank you. President, Treasurer Board. Thank you, Speaker. The member opposite, Speaker, in her question talked about what's more important and the juxtaposition. I want to say, Speaker, that as a government, it's important to strike a balance between attracting really great talent, which is what we've done, and setting fair and reasonable compensation packages for the broader public sector. We remain committed to ensuring fairness and accountability in terms of how that compensation is managed. But overall, Speaker, it's, we believe the people of Ontario have the right to know how their dollars are being spent, and they deserve a clear rationale for why executives are paid what they are. And that's why we implemented the broader public sector executive framework in 2016. This framework requires enhanced transparency through the public posting of executive compensation and framework so that the public can understand and appreciate, and it's an important exercise in democracy and accountability. Speaker. Ontarians yes, now have the opportunity to provide feedback as well. Speaker. We're proud of our public servants in this province, and we uh, have you. taken these important accountability measures. Thank you. New question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. For decades, people have come to Ontario Place to enjoy family fun and live music and build happy memories and take in the beautiful waterfront. We have been moving forward with our ambitious vision to transform Ontario Place into a modern, vibrant, year-round waterfront destination that engages residents and visitors of all ages. Yesterday, the Minister made an exciting announcement at Ontario Place give us a sneak peek of what's to come. As a local member, I feel very lucky to live so close to this beautiful space. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she tell us what Ontarians are looking forward to this summer? Thank you, Minister Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the fantastic member from Trinity Spadina for that question. 
So, Speaker, last year we made very significant progress in transforming our vision into reality. We opened the Trillium Park and William G. Davis Trail and added seven and a half acres of green space to the waterfront. We hosted free family fun with winter at Ontario Place. It featured a skating rink and light installations, and I'm happy to share with you all today that we're going to keep the momentum going. This summer, Ontario Place is going to be hosting a music series every Thursday featuring emerging artists from every genre, including indie rock, folk, hip-hop, and jazz. There's going to be family dance and music performances on Sunday afternoons and speaker. We're also going to have outdoor activities such as beach volleyball and free skating on the outdoor synthetic rink. Answer. And speaker, stay tuned. I look forward to unveiling some exciting new details in the supplementary. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And it's fantastic to hear that the vision that proposed a mix outdoor and indoor features, including more green space, recreational activities like beach volleyball and a waterfront trail around the entire site. The urban park and the trail is dramatic, dramatically trans transforming the Toronto waterfront with a new green space that celebrates the, natural, the nature and cultural legacy of Ontario Place. As a local member, I know how important it is to gather feedbacks from the public, including the residents from Fort York, Liberty Village, City Place, Bathurst Key, and surrounding neighbourhoods. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can she tell the member of this House about the next steps of Ontario, uh, Ontario Place revitalization? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Trinity Spadina, who, by the way, joined me yesterday at our beautiful waterfront to announce our next milestone in the rebooting of Ontario Place. So, Speaker, just a few months ago, I announced our plan to design a new green space. It's going to be known as Celebration Common, and it will be Toronto's newest waterfront park. It's coming in at a size of about 14 football fields. Wow. The park is going to include a children's outdoor play area, walking paths and trails, a beach area for outdoor recreation and water sports, and lots of room to host large-scale festivals. And most importantly, Speaker, there's going to be plenty of green space. Speaker, on this side of the House, we believe in protecting our environment, not paving over paradise. I'm confident that uh, Celebration Common is going to become Ontario's Answer. new urban backyard where people can kick back and enjoy Toronto's beautiful waterfront. Thank you. Any question? The member from Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is uh, to the Premier. Speaker, the Liberal government is trying to strong-arm the horse racing industry into accepting a deal that might yeah. hurt them in the long run. Just two weeks ago, the government sprang a massive, long-term funding agreement on horse people. It's nearly 200 pages and written in complex legal language. Here, and here's the kicker. They gave the racetracks breeders and horse people until May the 1st to sign the agreement, or else. Why is this government playing politics with horse people's livelihoods and pressuring them to sign onto a 19-year agreement in the final weeks before an election? Here, here. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite makes reference to the fact that we have now strengthened and sustained horse racing and breeding by putting a $105 million 19-year agreement, Mr. Speaker. We've also provided an enhanced horse improvement program that is extended year over year by OMAFRA. We have a new, what's called the Racetrack Sustainability and Innovation Fund, $6 million over three years to support regional racetracks to innovate, diversify, and expand their revenue sources. And, Mr. Speaker, OLG is also providing additional funding to supplement those racetracks that may be experiencing shortfalls and enable long term decisions about horse breeding. More importantly, Mr. Speaker, we've established a new board. The Ontario Racing Board will now be responsible for all the strategic plans and, is, and with also providing the service provider to ensure that those funds are transparent and accountable. And, Mr. Speaker, and, we're making it that there's going to have to be horse breeders on that board and small tracks on that board, five seats for race tracks, five seats Thank for you. breeders, and an independent chair. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. The Minister of Finance claims his long-term agreement, quote, will provide the stability needed to strengthen and sustain horse racing and breeding in Ontario. And yet that same minister has approved 
plans to rip the slot machines out of Kawartha Downs, Ajax Downs, and other community racetracks, threatening their uh, future viability. Now, on the cusp of an election campaign, his officials are threatening to freeze out horse people if they don't sign on to a 19-year deal. Sign it or else. The deal they haven't had, a deal that they haven't had time to read. What happens if one or more racetracks refuse to sign? Will the government cut off their funding, or will they, or will they set aside politics and let horse people have meaningful input after the election? Here, here. Minister. Minister of Amafra. Minister. Economic, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the uh, uh, supplementary from the uh, member from Perth Wellington. The reason that we chose uh, uh, 19 years, Mr. Speaker, uh, $2 billion over those 20 years, uh, because when you have insight in the horse racing industry in Ontario, it works on a cycle. It usually is uh, three to four. We uh, usually work three to four years before a horse, uh, whether it's a standard bred horse or a thoroughbred horse. A member from Halliburton Court of the Lakes Brock is warned. Carry on. As we consulted widely with the industry, a thoroughbred horse or a standard bred horse usually takes three or four years from the time it's born to the time it gets trained and eventually gets the track. So anything shorter than That's 19 right. years, you don't have the confidence in the industry. What are the things this government want to do to make sure there's a future path for all 15 tracks in the province of Ontario. New question, a member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Volunteer firefighter Gary Kendall died in 2010 in a dangerous winter river being trained by an unregulated private trainer. The family called for a coroner's inquest. They didn't get one. No one did anything to prevent another tragedy. Five years later, firefighter hopeful Adam Brunt died while taking a private, unregulated rescue training course on a dangerous winter river with the same unregulated private trainer. Adam died while 11 other students helplessly tried to save him. Two unnecessary deaths no one held responsible. And finally, after two men died, the families got a coroner's inquest. I've been pushing to protect firefighter trainees for the past three years. My motion to immediately adopt all coroner's inquest jury, re jury recommendations to keep future trainees safe was passed unanimously. You said it was urgent. You said you'd take action. Premier, what's the status of the changes and actions needed to ensure no one is ever put at risk like this Question. again? Have all of the coroner's inquest recommendations been adopted yet? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and you know, uh, what happened uh, in this incident is a tragedy, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my thoughts are with the families and colleagues uh, of those two trainees who passed away. Uh, I really commend the member opposite in her advocacy on this matter, and I know this is something she's worked very, very hard over the past years. Our government has carefully, uh, are, is carefully addressing, Mr. Speaker, the findings and the recommendation of the coroner's inquest into these deaths, and the Office of the Fire Marshal and Emergency Management took immediate action and suspended the water rescue program at the Ontario Fire College after this inquest, Mr. Speaker. Our government continues to work with the fire safety technical table where our fire safety partners Answer. and experts meet to discuss the fire safety challenges. And that table uh, are looking at the recommendation, Mr. Speaker, and certainly uh, we hope to have solutions. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, again to the Premier, and you, you can't suspend a training program that didn't exist in the first place. But it's been eight years since Gary died. It's been over three years since Adam died. Since this government hasn't chosen to figure out how to protect firefighter trainees, I have worked for three years on this, and I have figured it out for you. My Bill 58, the Brunt and Kennel Act, lays out a comprehensive regulatory and safety framework to hold private trainers to account and keep firefighter trainees safe. Alongside the families of Adam Brunt and Gary Kendall, the Ontario Professional Firefighters Association, safety advocates across the province, and legal experts, we have finally completed this necessary legislation to ensure deaths like this cannot happen again in the province of Ontario. It has been a long and emotional journey to get here, but here we are with my legislation in front of us and still with time on the clock. Premier, will you promise to keep sure. our firefighter trainees safe? and ensure Bill 58 passes through this House and into law before the end of the session. Okay. 
You say the truth. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you very much. And certainly, the, the, the safety of the firefighter is uh, very important. And I want to commend them for all the work that they do all across our province. And we are taking action to modernize the fire safety delivery in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Part of this modernization is to ensure our world-class firefighters have the support they need. Ensuring firefighters are fully trained and certified in their role is critical for their safety and the safety of the public. This is why we are proposing that firefighters be certified to the National Fire Protection Association standards. And this aligns with the Occupational Health and Safety Act, Mr. Speaker, which requires that employees receive sufficient training. My ministry will continue to work, and I, as a government and the minister, will work uh, to make this proposed requirement as seamless Answer. as possible. And we will continue to engage to ensure that every single firefighter in this province are safe, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Thank you. New question, member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the minister responsible for early years and child care. Oh, minister, minister, our government is committed to making sure families have access to high-quality, inclusive, and affordable child care. This is what my constituents in Davenport want and expect. Yeah. Under Doug Ford's plan, families will receive a rebate of just $34 a month. This proves just how out of touch he is Completely with the needs of, of family on the ground. Our government's recent announcement of free child care for preschool aged children from age two and a half to when they are eligible to start free full day kindergarten will help ease the financial burden on tens Absolutely. of thousands of families. Families will save an estimated $17,000 per child, allow parents to go back to work when they choose, and help give children the oh. best start in life. Can the minister expand on her announcement last Question. week and what this means for parents in my riding and across Ontario, and what are they looking for to access childcare? Minister responsible for early years in childcare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Davenport for that important question. Speaker, the reality is that we know that parents and children are benefiting from Ontario's high-quality childcare programs, but we also know there's more work to do. That's why we continue to build on our commitment to help 100,000 more children get access to quality, affordable, licensed childcare, because we are building a solid foundation for childcare in our province. So, last week, we announced that our government is investing $78.6 million in capital funding to build more than 3,100 licensed community-based childcare spaces. Think about that. We're building spaces right where families need them. Speaker, our investments are giving thousands of Ontario families support, while Doug Ford's child care scheme Answer. is a $1.3 billion annual cut to child care. They promise to cut programs that ease the financial challenges families Thank face. You. Supplementary. And I want to thank shop, the minister shop, shop, for that shop. answer. And last week's announcement is indeed another step forward to creating affordable and accessible childcare across our province. Very it's clear that our government is truly transforming the way childcare is delivered in Ontario. There is no question that more access to childcare is critical for Ontario families. However, could the minister please explain what makes last week's announcement so important and how this will help families in my riding of Davenport? and across Ontario in diverse situations access childcare. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to answer the member's question. Mr. Speaker, we are taking a number of important steps to ensure that every child and family in Ontario has access to a high range of quality and affordable care. Public spaces like places of worship, community centres and Indigenous friendship centres strengthen our communities, and creating childcare spa spaces in these community hubs will make them even stronger and give families access to childcare right in their neighbourhoods. Just think about that. 
childcare spaces for families where their child will be safe and well cared for close to home. This is an important part of our commitment to invest in families and bring free childcare to preschoolers across the province. The party's opposite will do nothing, Mr. Speaker, to build more capacity for childcare or the workforce to Answer. deliver that care. Our government is focused on building even stronger communities for children, families, and for the future of this province. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Carnage Alley got its name because of the appalling accidents and fatalities that have occurred there. In 1999, the largest vehicle pileup in Canadian history occurred in Carnage Alley. I know because I was there, but thankfully unhurt. The government of the day responded by widening the highway from Tilbury to Windsor by adding a concrete barrier there. In 2009, uh, this government's election had promised to widen 401 from four lanes to six lanes between Tilbury and Lambeth with the addition of a concrete medium barrier. But that stretch of 117 kilometres between those two areas remains untouched, and with the scheduled building of the Gordie Hall Bridge in Windsor, traffic, transport traffic is only going to worsen in the coming years. Premier, you know I've advocated for this for many years, and you told me and this legislature that a barrier would be built. We need a concrete barrier. So, Premier, what do you actually plan to do, Question. and when do you plan to do it? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, and I uh, want to thank the member for this question. And I know that we were together uh, just shortly after I took over this portfolio with people for along that stretch of uh, 401 in order to look at the issue. We will be building a concrete barrier. Sure. And in the meantime, while we are doing the environmental assessment and continuing to do the necessary work to widen the stretch of 401, to add the concrete barrier, we are going further than that because I don't want to wait for the length of time it's going to take to make that barrier. This year, we will be uh, starting to install high-tension cable barriers in uh, almost half the stretch between uh, Tilbury and London to make sure that there's protection right away. It's going to take us time to continue the necessary work. Yes, we committed that at the time, and we are continuing to move forward. The rest requests for proposals are going out to build this immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you. Well, back to the Premier. Carnage alleys, narrow lanes, and dangerous curvatures are extremely hazardous, especially in winter. I travel this road frequently from Chatham to Toronto. As a matter of fact, in 2017, there were five fatalities on that stretch. Three were from crossovers, including the fatality of a five-year-old girl and her mother. This year, on April 25th, a double crossover of a transport and minivan occurred, thankfully not fatal. But accidents continue to happen on a more frequent basis. Now, I've raised this issue several times before while the construction on 401 between Tilbury and Highway 40 was finishing up last year. Your ministry officials stated in a meeting with the Build the Barrier group from Chatham that the contract could be opened up to include building a concrete barrier at that time, but sadly it wasn't. Question. My petition quickly gained more than 4,000 signatures. Premier, we need a concrete barrier, not a cable barrier. Why won't you build a concrete barrier now? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And again, this is not a partisan issue. We are moving forward in the short term to protect that length of highway as soon as we can. The member was there with the technical experts. He knows that it takes time to do the environmental assessment up to a year or two. Then we have to do the design to widen the highway. You cannot put a concrete barrier on a four-lane highway. It has to be expanded. While we're doing that necessary work, we are going forward this year to make sure that that stretch of highway is protected. We've found a way to expedite the process. We will be uh, installing those high-tension cable barriers that are 97 per cent effective in other jurisdictions to stop the crossovers. Contrarily, I would like to know where the PC stands on this issue. We know that there's no, no dollars for uh, infrastructure along yes, that sir. area. I don't know how they're going to pay for it. I'm like Doug Ford. We're moving forward to make sure that we're going quickly. Be seated, please. Be seated, please.
Order, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, my question is to the Premier. A number of people across Ontario, like in Timmins, are trying to buy these electric cars because they want to do the right thing. And in Timmins, we have a number of people that have actually bought them. But here's the problem. Unless you charge it at home, you can't go anywhere because the company KSI, to which your government gave the contract to, to build the charging stations, is not servicing and fixing their charging units that break down. So I've got a guy who calls me the other day, leaves Timmins because he wants to drive towards North Bay for something, leaves Timmins, can't get a charge out of the station in Timmins because it's been broke for a while and not fixed, drives down to Earlton, gets to the Earlton and finds out that one hasn't worked since last August. So he had to go back to his dad's place, plug his car in overnight so that he's able to drive back to Timmins, get his gas car, then drive back down the highway to go do what he had to do. Question. When are you going to fix these KSI units? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, and I, uh, I appreciate the question along the way because it allows us on this side of the House to talk about the great investments that we've been yeah. doing in electric, electric vehicles in the province. We're up 120 per cent of the strongest jurisdiction for people to continue to uh, purchase electric vehicles, saving our environment. But we are continuing through our electric vehicle chargers uh, uh, Ontario program to continue to expand the number of charges available throughout Ontario. We understand that we have had some issues along the way to make sure that the uh, the chargers are in and working, but some of the vehicles on the on the road now take less time to charge altogether. We are very happy to be changing over from, from a vehicle system that is causing uh, yes, more carbon to be put in the air to making sure that we have clean vehicles moving forward. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, the car can't move forward. It's got no charging system. <laughs> the system has been broken since last August in Earlton, apparently from what this individual was telling me. How can you have a system in place that people can't use and boast about how your program is working is beyond me. So I ask you again, could you please get on to the people that you contracted these chargers to, such as KSI, to ensure that if they install these things, that they keep them operational and people don't get stranded, as my constituent did? Minister. Thank you very much, and uh, I wanted to again thank the member for the uh, for the supplementary. But our program has provided Ontarians with incentives to help purchase over 16,000 EVs and over 3,000 home and workplace chargers. We expect to see the numbers grow. We understand it's frustrating for those who are unable to uh, get into used chargers that may be broken. We're continuing to work with our contractor to get in there and expedite the process to not only install them but to actually repair them and keep them going. Because of our commitment to charging infrastructure, drivers know that they can still travel the distances they otherwise would have with a traditional vehicle. We're continuing to work with those areas. I'd like to know this from the NDP. Are they going to vote for the budget Answer. that contains the investments that we've made in the past to continue to make sure that we have more electric charging vehicles and systems around Ontario? New question, the member from Ottawa. So. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. There's a great deal of concern in my community of Ottawa and in the Ottawa Valley about Chalk River Laboratories. Canadian Nuclear Laboratories is planning to build a disposal facility for radioactive waste near the Chalk River Laboratories. The site would hold approximately 1 million cubic metres of low- and mid-level nuclear waste, and it is less than one kilometre away from the Ottawa River. Speaker, I've heard these concerns, and I too am concerned. I worry about the risk that nuclear waste could contaminate the Ottawa River. So, Speaker, my question to the minister is this. What is our government doing to ensure the protection of the environment and human health, 
in regards to this proposed project. Great the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa South uh, for that important question and for his continued advocacy on behalf of uh, his uh, constituents, because it is, uh, Speaker, a very important issue. You know, uh, we understand why it is such an important issue, too, uh, and that's why experts from my ministry have been uh, actively participating uh, in, publicly, in the public commenting uh, uh, process uh, as the federal government moves ahead. You know, in fact, last August, my ministry submitted comments to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission for the draft environmental impact statement. Speaker, uh, the comments and concerns provided by my ministry included concerns around stormwater management, the limits for contaminants, and the sharing of public information around monitoring locations. Answer. Speaker, we know how important it is to get this right. That's why we're engaged with our federal partners and will continue to work on behalf of the uh, members' uh, uh, mem uh, constituents. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Uh, Speaker, this is an ongoing process, and it's important to ensure that our natural environment remains protected. The Ottawa River is an important source of drinking water, a natural home to many animals and species, as well as a resource of, or a resource of recreation for many. The Ottawa Riverkeeper, Ecology Ottawa, local First Nations, and individuals have expressed their concern that the proposed near-surface disposal facility being built is uh, being built because of the potential impacts nuclear waste could have on the river. Earlier this year, my constituent Ole Hendrickson wrote to me expressing his concerns that non-radioactive contaminants like PCBs and dioxins in the facility's waste could fall between the cracks. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our Question. government is doing to protect the Ottawa River in regards to the Chalk River Waste Disposal Site? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Ottawa South for that very important question. You know, I just want to reiterate, Speaker, that uh, these are very real concerns, and we need to be vigilant. Uh, I understand the jurisdictional issues with this facility, but it's still important for us to protect uh, our communities here in Ontario. So that's why my ministry submitted comments to the federal government's proposal to ensure all precautions are being taken around this project. You know, as a result, Speaker, the provinces uh, of, of our comments, the federal government changed the project to include only low-level types of uh, nuclear waste. Speaker, the, the federal government uh, has also ensured us, uh, assured us that uh, the waste intended for disposal in the proposed project will meet all of the required international guidelines as well. Again, yes, I want to thank the member for Ottawa South for his advocacy, and we will continue to monitor this project. Thank you. New question. The member from Stormont Dundas, South Hungary. Thank you. Speaker to the Premier. Recently, tenants in the senior citizen social housing development in my riding were told some shocking news. They were informed that due to necessary cuts, they would now be responsible for mopping the floor and washing the countertops. They were just handed industrial equipment and told folks, get her done. Over 90 per cent of the tenants have balance or mobility issues. Many use walkers, and most are in their 80s and 90s. They deserve a safe living environment. The, the uh, government has consistently shortchanged municipalities throughout in it, with inefficient infrastructure funding, cutting the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund and neglecting the needs of rural Ontario residents. It is cutting municipal transfers to such low levels that, is, that it results in making seniors in affordable housing mop the floors really the right way to treat the people who built this province, putting them at risk of injury as a way to solve Question. this government's spending and debt problems. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, um, I do, you know, I really do commend the member opposite for his concern about uh, infrastructure funding for municipalities in general, Mr. Speaker. We certainly have a housing plan. We're working with the federal government to put in place more affordable housing, more supportive housing. We have, uh, we have increased uh, funding to municipalities for housing, Mr. Speaker, and changed the change the flexibility that allows them to uh, make investments. But, Mr. Speaker, it was it's very interesting to me that this member is standing in his place and asking a question about this when his leader, uh, Doug Ford, was in Cornwall and said that municipalities were going to have to make cuts in order to be able to continue to get infrastructure spending at all. 
if he were the premier, Mr. Speaker. So I really I encourage the member to have a conversation with his leader because if though if infrastructure funding for municipalities is dependent on cuts, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't bode well for the future. Thank you. I wish to um, turn to the member from Leeds Grenville on a point of order. Point of order. I'd just like to uh, ask for uh, unanimous consent to, uh, to have a moment of silence for uh, my MP, Gord Brown. Uh, Gord uh, passed away this morning in Ottawa. Uh, he was an amazing MP. Speaker, we, uh, we dreamed uh, as young, young men to once serve in this legislature and in the House of Commons, and we, we realize that. Uh, I want to express on uh, behalf of the House uh, our deepest sympathies to uh, Gord's wife, Claudine, and his two sons, uh, Chance and Tristan. Uh, we're going to miss him. I'm going to miss him. Like, Speaker, he was like a brother to me, and Eastern Ontario and the province and our country mourn the loss of Gord Brown. So I would appreciate consent to, uh, to have a moment of silence. The member from Leeds Grenville is seeking unanimous consent for a moment of silence to pay respects. Do we agree? agree. I would ask everyone in the House to please rise for a moment of silence in honour of MP Brown. We do have a deferred vote of the Government Notice of Motion No. 8 relating to allocation of time of Bill 53, an act respecting the establishment of minimum government contract wages. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
All members, please take your seats. On May 1, 2018, Mr. Chan moved government notice of motion number eight relating to allocation of time on Bill 53 and Act respecting establishment of minimum government contract wages. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Knight and Harris. Ms. Knight and Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mr. Codger. Mr. Codger. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. All those opposed, please, for us one at a time, you're recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Madame Jelen. Madame Jelen. Mr. Fife. Mr. Fife. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Monta. Mr. Mont. Mr. Sattler. Mr. Sattler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Forrester. Mr. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 47, the nays are 33. The ayes being 47, the nays being 33, I declare the motion carried. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.